uh, chapter 14, part 2 tonight. And really what I would entitle this sermon is uh, Hyper-Religious Saul. Hyper-Religious Saul. I think Saul here, we see a lot of uh, traits exhibited by him that would be indicative of somebody being hyper-religious. Hyper-religious. And of course, if you remember last week, we stopped there at uh, verse 24, it was where, or verse 23. We'll pick it up tonight in verse 24. And last week we talked about the fearful and the faithful, how Jonathan was one that acted on faith, and we see that Saul was very fearful, and he made some uh, you know, major mistakes here. But uh, really throughout this whole chapter, you see that Saul is a guy who's kind of uh, you know, a hyper-religious type of guy. Now what do I mean by that hyper-religiosity? Religiosity. And well, hyper religiosity is characterized by an increased tendency to report spiritual, religious, or mystical experiences. Now, we've probably all known somebody like this to, to some degree who suffered from this from some degree to another throughout our life. I know I can think back over the years and think of several examples. And I remember when I first got saved, you know, got into a church, wasn't long, I started to run into other, you know, religious people. And sometimes the stories that they would tell of their experiences were just, you know, I'm thinking, well, why didn't I ever experience anything like that? And, you know, even, even things that are more tame or more commonly accepted, even amongst, you know, Baptist churches, I even think that they smack of being hyper-religious. I remember one guy I ran into, you know, he was t I was like trying to question, I didn't really know how to get the gospel at this point, I wasn't, you know, versed in that. But I remember wanting to do it, and I asked the guy about, you know, whether he was saved, going to heaven, and I said, well, why are you saved? You know, I knew at least to ask that much. And he said, well, you know, I got into, I was out late one night, and I got into a fender bender, and, you know, it was kind of a serious accident. And he, some, some about he got in an accident, it was more than a fender bender, I shouldn't use that, but he got in some kind of a serious accident, the details are a little fuzzy, but he's, he claimed that an angel of the Lord appeared unto him and spoke with him. And, he, I mean, he just said it like, and, you know, an angel showed up. And, I, you know, he told me about Jesus, and I'm just thinking, what were you doing out late at night? What were you doing before you got in the car, you know? But it's like these hyper-religious experiences that people want to report. And that's kind of what we read there in that definition, is that somebody who has an increased tendency to report spiritual or religious or mystical experiences. They want to tell you about these just grandiose experiences that they've had. You know, and I've even got a taste of this even, like I said, in Baptist churches. You know, people get confused sometimes about how God talks to them. You know, I've been in churches where they literally think that, like, if you're, if you're holy enough and sinless enough that God is going to speak to you. Not audibly, but you know, like, you know that little voice in your head? That's your voice in your head. That's not God. Okay? You say, well, how does God speak to us? Right here. And he's got a lot to say. You know, what else more does he need to say? You know, we've got, you've got plenty to think about right here. And you know, God, of course, can you know, speak to us through the scriptures, lay a scripture on our heart, but God doesn't come to you and go, psst, hey, hey you, psst, hey kid. You know, it doesn't try to get your attention and tell you, you know, special things just for you. You know, and listen, people, you know, that's funny, and it is, you know, looking back on it, but that can be a real, that can create a real internal struggle in some people. Because what if you're in a church like that, and you're the person who's not being spoken to like that? You know, you think you're insane, or you think you're too, you know, you're too, sin, you're too sinful or whatever. Well, gee, everybody else, you know, apparently it's just God's talking to them, but I go and pray, and it's like nothing happens. That's, yeah, because you're normal. <laughs> because you're not, you know, one of these hyper-religious type of people that thinks that, you know, God, they're so holy and they're so righteous that God is just speaking directly to them. Now, does God minister to our heart and bring things to mind, things like that? Yeah. But, you know, people get carried away with it sometimes. And that's, you know, even something you see even in Baptist churches. A lot of people, they, they teach this and they believe this. This is, a, this is a way that they approach, you know, uh, the Lord. But, you know, there's, we could even go beyond that. You know, people who, uh, you know, had these, uh, these hyper-religious -relig types, you know, they have, you know, what we see in Saul's experience here is this, you know, relig religious delusions, uh, rigid legalistic thoughts, and extravagant expressions of religiosity. Religious, religiosity, that's a very hard word to say, by the way. But Saul here, you know, he, he characterizes several of these things, and he expresses, you know, first of all, this extravagant religious ceremony. If you recall last week, you know, in verse, in verse 2, it says, And Saul tarried in the almost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is a Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. men and, so he goes on, And he also had with him there Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, 
the Lord's priest in Shiloh. And we talked about last week how this guy Ahiah is a fake priest. If you recall, Samuel's the real priest. Samuel is of the Levitical priesthood. He was the priest that God was using at that time. And we talked about how Ahiah was the descendants of Eli, to whom God said, you know, I'm done with you. I'm done with your line. I'm done with your lineage. You know, Phineas and, and Eli, or Hophni and Phineas ruined it for him. And Eli himself ruined it because he did not chasten his sons. He honored his sons above God. So he's got this Ahiah with him. You know, and of course, it was, we talked about the story about how it's after the fact that, you know, Samuel already said, you know, God's going to take the kingdom from you and give it to a man after his own heart. You know, and then he goes and finds himself another priest. Well, if Samuel's not going to be with me, let me just go get Ahiah. Because Ahiah's got the ephod and he's got all the religious ceremony. I mean, he looks the part, he talks the part. And what Saul's showing us is his, you know, his, his hyper-religious nature. You know, this is something that characterizes people. And he has it because why? Because he has this extravagant religious ceremony going on. He has a fake priest. And I say it's extravagant because it's unneeded. Of course, you know, having a high you know, having a priest in the ephod that God ordained that. But I'm saying it's extravagant because it's not necessary. God didn't ask him to go find a haya. You know, God didn't ask him to go get that fake priest. He already had a priest. You know, maybe Samuel didn't look the part, but he was God's man. You know, maybe he didn't have every he wasn't all polished and put together and had all the, you know, the, the, all the you know, accoutrements of, of being a high priest. But, you know, he was God's man. He was anointed, and God used him mightily. And he was the one that God had uh, raised up in the house of the Lord. So he has the fake priest. Not only that, but he has, of course, the religious ceremony. Right? And he said unto, in verse 18, And Saul said unto him, unto Ahiah, his fake priest, Bring hither the ark of God. We talked about how this was after the fact that Jonathan had already started the battle. He'd already gone and fought the garrison, the garrison of the Philistines. God was already moving and, and acting on, you know, what moved God to action was Jonathan's faith, right. not Saul's hyper-religious ceremony with this fake priest. And of course, you know, when we talk about this, we should, our minds might instantly go to the Catholic Church. I mean, the Catholic Church has all these things. They have fake priests. You know, the guys that stand up in front of everybody and wear a dress and can't get their collar on right? <laughs> fake priests. You know, they dress like Dada, and, and, or they, what is it, they, they call themselves Dada and dress like Mama, right? <laughs> it's true. They have the long flowing garments, and Jesus warned about, you know, beware of those that go in long garments. I mean, that's where my mind goes to. With this high, and, and it, boy, is the Catholic Church hyper-religious? Yeah. Absolutely. Why do you think they have so many, you know, like what, a billion followers in the world or something like that? One-seventh of the world's population claims to be, you know, Catholic. You know, a lot of people just, they, they're not in the Catholic Church because they love the doctrine. They love the experience. They love the hyper-religious nature of going to the Catholic Church. I mean, San Xavier down here, you want to talk about a hyper-religious place. I mean, you want to go see a beautiful, you know, quote-unquote, Catholic Church. There's, you know, an ancient Catholic Church right down here. You know, I've never been there. I've seen a few pictures here and there. But from what I've told, it's quite ornate. Who's ever been there? It's all right. I'm not going to come at, I'm not going to get after you. All right. <laughs> It wasn't, wasn't last Sunday, was it? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> is, it pretty, is it pretty ornate in there? Do you have a lot of decorations? What's the one over in Rome? Like uh, the, the Sistine Chapel, right? I mean, when you're bringing in a world-renowned painter to, to paint on the, on the ceiling, these, these beautiful paintings and things like that, why are you doing that? Because you're hyper-religious. Because you have this, just this love of religious ceremony. You love it when he comes out and he waves his dust buster around and dusts up the place, right? And just gets that scent going. And then they start speaking. You know, I had a great aunt who was Catholic, and she didn't speak Latin, but she would only go to a Latin mass. That was the real Catholic. I mean, she'd come up, and, I, and she, you know, I love her. She was a sweet lady, so on and so forth. But she'd come up, and she, they would go on. She's passed on, folks, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. She'd come up with her, uh, my, my great uncle, and they would go on tour to all the casinos in, in the area. And they, that's where there's their vacation. They would just go to all the, just play the slots. You know, that's how they'd go out and see the country and play the slots. And she'd always go to like, she'd know where all the, the right Catholic churches were that had the Latin mass. They liked to hear, to go there and hear, you know, you know, I don't speak it either, right? My father is better than your father at Domino's or something like that, right? They, they're, they're just really into, you know, the religious experience. You know, and Saul, Saul, you know, he's exhibiting some of this. You know, he has this hyper-religious nature about him. And I'm just using him as an example tonight 
Well, that's what we see even in people today, that they, have this, they, they, they go for this kind of thing. They go for the fake priests. They go for the religious ceremony. And, <laughs> yeah, and then a result, unfortunately for Saul, it results in a fake spirituality, a spirituality that's not real. You know, we run into people like this all the time. I mean, they, they, they sound good. They say the right thing. Well, they don't even really say the right things, but they talk about God. They talk about the Bible. They talk about this religious experience and this spiritual experience and whatever, but it's fake. At the end of the day, it's not real because it doesn't line up with Scripture. It's fake. It's not needed. And you see that in verse 19. It said, and it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priest. So remember, the battle takes place. And he says, bring hither the ark. You know, he has his religious ceremony with his religious priest, his fake priest, and they bring the ark. But then it says that the noise of the, in the camp increased and grew on. So the battle just keeps getting stronger before the ark even gets there. And Saul says in verse 19, And it came to pass while Saul spake, uh, talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, Withdraw thine hand. He said, Oh, I guess turns out it's not needed. Why? Because it's fake. It's a fake spirituality. God wasn't saying, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do something once you get that ark in there. Once you get your priest in order and get the ark in there and you do all the right religious things, Saul, then I'll, then I'll move. God was already moving on the real spirituality that Jonathan had that he exhibited when he walked out and did something big for God by faith. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because we talked about that quite a bit last week. We talked about that. But so Saul here, he does, ex, you know, he, he, he expresses this extravagant, just unneeded religious ceremony with the ark and the priest, and, and then, he, you know, it shows his, his fake spirituality. But Saul also suffers here, I believe, from being hyper-religious, and we see that through his, his rigid, legalistic thinking. That was part of that definition. People who are hyper-religious, they have, uh, you know, religious delusions and rigid, legalistic thoughts, okay? And this is what I believe Saul has here. And, what we, and, the, and you see that in the fact that he adheres to formula rather than faith. He adheres to formula rather than faith. He's kind of going through the motions here, if you know what I mean. He's saying, oh, there's a battle. That means we need a priest. And oh, we also need the ark. He's just kind of going down a checklist in his mind. He's not really into it. His heart's not there. He's just going through this rigid, just you know, legalistic type of thinking, just, uh, you know, uh, just trying to check off a list. He had, he's adhering to formula rather than faith. And you can kind of see a contrast in this when we go to the example of Esther. And if you would, go over to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. I'll remind us of what, what took place in our story here in 1 Samuel. He says, And the man of, and men of Israel distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people. You know, adjured them, saying, and that's like a, you know, really trying to persuade somebody, you know, adjuring somebody is, is trying to really influence them strongly. I mean, it, you're, you're, it's practically threatening. Right? He's trying to adjure them, uh, the people saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening. So he just, on his own accord, right? nobody asked him to. God didn't say, hey, we're not doing anything with these Philistines until you proclaim a fast. No, Saul just gets up and says, Don't anybody eat anything until evening. That, and he goes on and says, That I may be avenged of mine enemies, so none of the people tasted any food. And of course, the men of Israel were distressed because of that. Now, Esther, if you recall, she, if you know the story of Esther, you know, she was, a, a, she was a, a, a Jew who was married to the king there, and the, the king, one of the king's top guys had proclaimed, uh, made a proclamation that all the Jews should be killed, right? And then her, you know, her uncle Mordecai comes to her, right, and, and implores her to go to the king to ask for mercy, right, and to expose the plot, if you know the story. In Esther chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself, uh, with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. He's saying, look, don't, don't think that you're gonna, if you decide to do nothing, that you're going to be okay and everybody else is going to die. He's saying, look, God will, will expose you too and you'll get killed. <laughs> he says, for if, thou hast, uh, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then there shall an... Uh, then shall there be, an, excuse me, and then, the, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. He's saying, look, if you don't do it, oh, it's really coming down. He's saying, look, if you don't do it, God's going to find somebody else to do it, right? So he's kind of telling Esther, you need to go do this. Not like Saul. Nobody asked Saul. Saul is just like, I'm, gonna, I'm proclaiming a fast, you know, so that I might be avenged of mine enemies. Whereas when we look at the example of Esther, who also proclaimed a fast, I mean, Mordecai is basically twisting her arm. I mean, he's really saying, look, if you don't do this, if you don't go in there and ask, ask the king to show mercy and expose this plot, 
you know, don't think you're going to get away with it, you know, and God is going to, you know, raise up deliverance from another people. <coughs> so Esther here, she, you know, she had to kind of be convinced, whereas Saul kind of came up with it on his own. And, you know, it just kind of goes to show us that, you know, he suffered. Why is that? Why did Saul, you know, kind of just do this on his own? Because he suffers from just this religious, overly religious, this hyper-religious religious trait of, you know, just, just rigid thinking, just, just rigid legalistic thinking. His heart's not really in it, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and he just, you know, would, he's just more concerned with making sure I have my priest in order. Does he got, is the right priest here? Does he have the ephod on? Does he look right? Is everything in order? You know, do we have the ark? Where's the ark? Get that in here. Oh, maybe, maybe we need to proclaim a fast as well, just to make sure. And he just does these things on his own, right? And again, that, you could go back to the Catholic Church with that one, you know, uh, commanding to abstain from meats, right? I mean, don't they do that every Friday, right? I remember, I know when I was up, where I, used to, where I came from, where I lived, you know, real high Catholic population, and you know, you could, the, the one benefit was is that they had great fish, fish fries everywhere. You know, on Friday, it was always just like all-you-can-eat perch here and all-you-can-eat this there, and, and that was really great. But what were they doing? They were, com they were just commanding these religious ceremonies, just this fast that you just must adhere to, right? And, and it ends up, you know, uh, burdening people unnecessarily. So Esther, she had to be convinced, and Saul kind of just comes up with it his own, on his own because Saul, you know, he suffers from the re religious, uh, rigid, legalistic thinking, and, you know, he, he has this fake spirituality, this religious ceremony, but he also suffers from religious delusion, unfortunately for Saul. He suffers, and really, you know, if you start, remember, if you were with us in the beginning of this, this book, it's a sad story because Saul started out so great. Saul was a very humble and meek person. I believe that. I believe he was a good man. And we start to see the downfall here. You know, the previous chapter is kind of where it kind of got the ball rolling, where Samuel had to come and tell him, like, look, God has taken the kingdom from you. He's going to give it unto another. You know, he's, he sought a man after, uh, after God's own heart. And he kind of tell him, like, you're going you're to be done with soon. And then even a next week in chapter 15, that's where he kind of seals the deal. But you can kind of see this transition in Saul, where he, he's trying to just hang on to his position. And you kind of see some of these bad traits start to come out. And it comes out in the form of being hyper-religious. You know, what, what he's doing is he's just, try, he's just being fake. You know, instead of just, you know, accepting the fact that he failed, just accepting the fact that he hasn't, you know, measured up or, or, he's, or to what he's supposed to be, you know, he just starts to put on a show. He just starts to try to convince people that he's something that he's not, which is, you know, right with God, because he's not right with God. But he suffers from religious de delusion there. And he says in verse 24 for Samuel, he keeps something there in Esther. It says, And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged of mine enemies. So Saul's doing all this because he's, he's focused on himself. He had, I'm so great. I'm this great leader. You know, I have all these enemies. And this is something that we'll see in the life of Saul, that he kind of hangs on to, just thinking much more highly than himself than he ought to think. And he's saying, Look, I should be avenged of my enemies. Why is he bringing in the fake priest? Why is he getting... The ark there. Why is he burdening the people with a fast that nobody asked for so that he could be avenged of his enemies? He's suffering from religious delusion, in my opinion. This is a, a trait that we could see in him. And he's convinced that this proclamation of just, hey, nobody eat anything until evening is going to what is going to be what ensures the victory. He's saying, look, we've got, you know, we got the priest. We got our we got the ark. We've got our fast. You know, you know, victory is ours. And he's convinced that him just getting up and going through the motions is what's going to ensure him a victory here. But when we recall the story of Esther, she's more realistic, right? She's, she's you know, being convinced to go in there and do it. She's basically being threatened like, hey, if you don't do it, you know, you're probably going to get judged by God. If you don't stand up for your people and do what's right here, don't think you're going to get away with it. And if you look at verse 15 of Esther chapter 4, it says, Then Esther bade them return unto Mordecai this answer. She's like, okay, well, I hear you. And she sends back her answer. And she says in verse 16, Go, gather all the Jews together that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. And I also and my maidens will fast likewise. Now, there's, there's maybe a difference there, because if you recall, when, when Saul proclaims this, this fast, where was he? Under a pomegranate tree. 
Now, it's real easy for the guy who's been eating all day to get up and say, oh, yeah, all right, we're all done eating, okay? Just, pff, you know, throw out the, the pomegranate I've been enjoying here. Whereas, you know, Esther here, she's proclaiming the fast, but she's right there with them. You know, we're going to see a little bit how sometimes the hyper-religious person becomes a hypocrite. Now, maybe Saul wasn't eating the pomegranates. I don't know. That's just kind of making application there, but you see what I'm trying to say. And Esther here, she's more realistic, though, in the outcome. So she proclaims this fast, and, and Saul, you know, in his, religi you know his, his religious delusion, his rigid least legalistic thinking is just, if I do this, this, and this, I'm going to have the victory. God has to answer if I go through these motions. You know, God is some kind of just, you know, spiritual vending machine, where if I put in a, no a certain amount of change and push these numbers, I'm going to get, you know, my favorite candy. If I do this for God and this for God, then he has to come through and do this. That's not always how it works. And Esther here, she's more realistic. Yes, she proclaimed a fast. She also partook in that fast, but notice what her response was. She said, I also, my maidens, will fast likewise, and I will go into the king, which is not according to law, and you know what? I'm going to set him straight. And you can count on it, Mordecai, that when I come back out, everything's going to be fine. That we will be avenged of our enemies. Was that her attitude? She said, and if I perish, I perish. She said, look, I don't know how it's going to turn out. You know, I might go in there and I, you might never see me again, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. You know, and she, she went through her, her you know, she had a, a, a religious ceremony, to, so to speak, as well. She was doing what she was supposed to do, but she had a more realistic, she wasn't suffering from a religious delusion is what I'm trying to say. She's more like Jonathan in this story. You know, Jonathan, he acted on faith, didn't he? He said in verse 6 of, of 1 Samuel chapter 14, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. He said it might be, but then again it might not be. So, you know, this, what I'm trying to say is when people are overly religious, they just assume that everything's going to turn out fine as long as they just go through their little checklist. As long as they, you know, do what they think God deserves from them, then everything's going to turn out fine. But the reality is, people who are acting on faith, you know, they just do it because it's the right thing to do, and they leave the results up to God. Amen. So Esther, uh, you know, she has a realistic here, uh, realistic expectations. But, you know, turning back to Saul, because he's kind of the subject of the sermon tonight. And go ahead and go back to 1 Samuel chapter 14. But Saul... You know, we see he, he's suffering from being hyper-religious here. It's manifesting in his, religi his religious ceremony, you know, his, his, his fake spirituality, his, his rigid legalistic thinking, his religious delusion that we just read about. But he also suffered, you know, and I'm going to go on more into the, the, the rigid re legalistic thinking that he had. Just very, being very just, you know, rigid in his thinking, Okay. It says in verse 36, And Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night. And of course, this is towards the end of the story. We're jumping ahead. Okay? This is after you know, the Philistines have already been put to flight, and Jonathan has already gone and taken some of the honey. right? And he said, and they've even had uh, the sacrifice. And Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and spoil them until the morning, and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. I love that. They, they say that several times in the chapter. You know what, Saul? Just, just do whatever you want. You know, they know there's no change in his mind. Saul gets something in his head. He's so rigid in his thinking, you can't change his mind. He can't be corrected. You know, say, hey, you know what? We've already, we've already you know, whooped the Philistines pretty bad. Everyone's pretty tired. We just ate a big meal. Can we just go home? You know, we ran them out of our land. That's really what we wanted. But Saul's trying, again, he's being hyper-religious here because he's trying to overcompensate for the fact that the kingdom has been taken from him. <laughs> and he says here, uh, they say, Do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Then the priest said, said the priest, Let us draw near hither unto God. And he, I leave, you can almost hear it in the guy's voice. Let us draw, like he's not like, hey, let's draw close to God. You know, hey, let's pray. You know, let us draw near hither unto God. He's got this kind of, this air about him, right? And he's, and he's using this, you know, this very religious speech. So the, the priest says, whoa, before we do anything, Saul, let's pray. You know, he's got this hyper-religious attitude. And, you know, and Saul likes it. Saul's like, yeah, let's do that. Now, you know, people, they may not go to this length, but sometimes we do that. Sometimes people have that attitude. You know, like, just coming with this, something that's coming to mind is like, you know, sometimes if you, if, if you go out to eat with somebody, you know, I, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't sit down and pray before every meal. <laughs> Sometimes I just start eating and I say, thank God for this food. And I don't get it. Hey, 
everybody, I'm about to have a bowl of cereal. Let's all get in here. You know, text you guys. Just want to let you know I prayed. You know. Sometimes I just start eating. And it's not, and it's, and it's not that I don't pray because I'm ungrateful. I am grateful. You know, let me just, you know, lose my reward right now in front of all of you. Sometimes when I get back from Tucson at night, it's just instinctive. I pull in that driveway and I say, thank you for the safety, Lord. It's just instinctive. You know, because it's just, it's there. And I don't say, I don't get out of the car and say, honey, kids, let's all get in the living room and all get down on our knees right now and just, you know what I mean? And I put on this hyper-religious show. And that's what this priest Ahia is doing. You know, maybe he's kind of suffering from some of the same things that Saul is. Because he knows that his line has been ended. He's like, well, let me just show to everybody that I'm still very religious and I still belong in the priesthood here. I'm the one with the ephod after all. I don't know what Samuel's been wearing, but, you know, let's all gather together and pray unto God. You know, some, and, and sometimes, you know, we, we, it almost, the, like the, the example of praying before you eat, that can almost turn into like a tradition of men. That can, I think it's good to do. As long as it's coming from the right place. If you really are thankful, say, hey, let's pray for this meal. I'm, I'm, I'll get, I'm all for it. Look, we're going to go home. The, the folks that came down with me, I guarantee you we're going to stop and eat somewhere on the way home because I've had a turkey sandwich at noon and I haven't eaten anything since. <laughs> right? We're going to hit somewhere. We're gonna eat, and you know what? We're probably going to pray for that meal. In fact, I, you know, I know we are. But what if, <laughs> what if we didn't? What if we didn't? You think we're all just going to choke on the food? No. Of course not. No, we're going to pray because we genuinely are thankful for the food. Right? But what if we didn't? What if, we, what if you're with somebody out at a meal and they, and they just start eating? <laughs> Heathen. <laughs> you wicked sinner. You know, and then the person across him is just like, pushes back, well, I've lost my appetite. <laughs> people can get like this. I'm saying people can get like this. They can just start to look down at other people like, well, they didn't pray before their meal. <laughs> is it because they're so unholy or is it because you're just so hyper-religious? I pray before every meal, you know. It's an attitude that's out there. And that's what I think we're seeing here in Saul. And this guy here, let us draw near hither unto God. And Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he answered him not that day. And he didn't like the answer he got. But that's because God was done with Saul. And we'll see why in chapter 15, where he goes with the Amalekite, that whole thing with the Amalekites. And he's finished. Saul's done. Put a fork in him. God doesn't want to use him anymore. So he answers him not. So Saul says, well, I guess we don't go. I guess that's my answer. You know, Saul doesn't stop and search his own heart. Saul doesn't examine his motives. Saul just turns on everybody else. Because again, he's hyper-religious. Clearly, the problem is not with me, says Saul. You know, if, if God's not answering, <laughs> it must be with one of you, right? And he goes on in verse 38. And Saul said, draw ye near here all the chief of the people. And know and see where in this sin hath been this day. We're going to find out who is responsible for my prayer not getting answered. It's kind of weird, Saul. It's hyper-religious is what it is. Maybe you're the problem, Saul. <laughs> you ever think about that? You ever run through your mind that maybe God's not answering you because of you? Despite all your, your religious show, despite all your ceremony, and, 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 and just all of that, that, that maybe you're not right with God. Maybe that's the problem, Saul. But no, he gets everybody together. And then, of course, he says, For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. And everyone's just supposed to be so impressed with Saul because of how religious he sounds. I'm willing to sacrifice everything for God. Well, are you really? Or should you? <laughs> you know, in this case. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Because it could, be, it could be taken as, you know, every, I don't think that's taken as, oh, everybody agreed with him. Everyone thought that was a good idea. I think everybody, I think what it means is just nobody was impressed. There was not, and everyone was like, oh, Saul, he's so holy. He's so religious. Did you see what he just said? Man, he sacrificed his own son. Wish I could be like Saul. No. They're not impressed. Okay, and we'll talk more about that. Well, the, the, the people that are around the hyper-religious individual in a minute here. And there was not a people that answered him. And then, they, and then he said unto Israel, Be ye on one side, and we know the story here. Then he finds out that it was Jonathan. Jonathan confesses. And, you know, and Jonathan, unfortunately, makes that weird statement, and lo, I must die. I mean, I would be pleading my case. I, I, you know, I, I'm trying to, I thought about that. Like, what's going on there? Maybe you have an answer. Because I really don't have one. Like, well, Jonathan, what are you thinking? What do you mean you must die? 
No, you, no, you don't deserve to die. You need to tell your dad to quit being so dumb and making these stupid vows. And, God, and Saul answered in verse 44, God, do so more and also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. This is his rigid, legalistic thinking. Just like, you know, whatever, you know, it, it, it's surely I'm not the problem. The problem's with, you know, because Jonathan, somebody must have done something that displeased God. They didn't check all the boxes like I have. They're not, you know, they're not following my commandments. And Saul is just so delusional that he fails to see the real sin. He's so delusional, he's so caught up in his own religious delusion, uh, delusions of grandeur that he can't even see the sin. Look at verse 31. We're, we're, I mean, God didn't answer, and there was definitely sin in, in this day, right? And it says in verse 31, They smote the Philistines from that day from Michmash to Ahijalon, and the people were very faint. And the people flew the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground. And the people did eat them with the blood. I mean, Saul's kind of a hypocrite here, don't you think? Why, is he, why isn't he killing the people? I mean, here he has the, the people, you know, it, it's even reported to him. It says, Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are against the Lord, and that they eat with the blood. I thought the decree that nobody was supposed to eat. And, Saul, and, and Jonathan takes a little honey, and now he must surely die. Well, what about the people? They flew upon the spoil. They broke your vow just the same. Because he's more concerned with impressing the people than actually following through on his word. He's just more, more concerned with making a religious impression by showing everybody how great I am. And if I kill all of you, then who's going to praise me? <laughs> well, if I take Jonathan out for his little bit of honey that he ate, then everyone will see how religious I am, how, you know, how great a man of God I am. And they'll all praise me, and I'll let them slide on their sin. Look, they flew on the spoil and they ate it with the blood. And Saul's just like, oh, didn't see anything. But then his prayer doesn't get answered. It's like, well, it's surely not because, it, it, I know I must not be because of me, so let's make up something. Uh, it's Jonathan. He's got to die. Look, he's suffering from being a hyper-religious hypocrite. <laughs> and he said, you have transgressed. Roll a great stone unto me this day. He says that in verse, uh, verse 33. I love that. You know, it's kind of like, somebody just shoot me, you know. It's like in that old expression. So we see that you know, Saul is a hyper-religious individual. You say, well, okay, we've established that, so what? Well, here's the thing about hyper-religious people, is that it's dangerous to be hyper-religious. Why? Because it harms people around them. The hyper-religious person will harm other people. Like the last thing you want is a hyper-religious preacher or pastor, because he'll harm the whole congregation. You know, you get some in some church where he just has all these unrealistic expectations for people. All you're going to do is hurt people. All you're going to do is just drive people away. <clears throat> you know, that's one form that, could, that can manifest. You know, even our own personal lives. If we become, you know, hyper-religious people, you know, where we just have these unrealistic expectations and we have these great delusions of grandeur and so on and so forth, all these things that we talked about tonight, you know, you're going to harm the people in your life. The people that you love and care about, want to see you get saved and all that, all you're going to do is push them away by being hyper-religious. It causes harm to other people. I mean, that's exactly what Saul did here with his hyper-religious mentality. He caused the people to be faint, right? Verse 24, and the men of Israel were distressed that day. Why were they distressed? Was it because the Philistines? No. The Philistines at this point, they're already being beaten. God's already moving because of what Jonathan had done. But Jonathan just stepping out in faith and putting the result, leaving the results in God's hands. They're already working. So they're not distressed about that. They're probably like, hey, excited to do something. And then Saul comes along and says, well, I'm not going to let Jonathan steal my thunder. We're proclaiming a fast, everybody, so that I can be avenged. And what does it do? And it distressed the people that day. For Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until leaving, that I may be avenged of mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. You know, that would distress me too. <laughs> In fact, I was just complaining about it a little bit a minute ago, wasn't I? All I've had was a turkey sandwich today. Look, these people didn't have anything. You know, they didn't, they didn't get to eat anything. They come upon the honey and they don't get to eat any of it because of Saul. Because of Saul being this hyper-religious guy. You know, he's putting these unnecessary burdens on the people. Look, when you're hyper-religious, you harm people around you. You make them faint. They can't handle it. And eventually they just, you know, get away. <clears throat> and it says, So none of the people tasted any food. Verse 25, And all day in the land came to wood, and there was honey upon the ground. I mean, if you're, hung if you're hungry and you come across some honey, 
I mean, I like honey when I'm full, right? Although it says the, the full so low than honeycomb, but you know, there's, there's, a, there's more to that saying. But look, you, know, you come across some honey, hungry or not, it tastes good. And you like that. It's, it's, I mean, to a hungry man, that, that's really something. And it says there, and no man, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. So they're just look. I mean, can you imagine just going into battle, just exhausted, like you know, going to work one day and just putting a hard day's work, just out in the heat, sweating. You know, you're just you're faint. You're just dragging yourself through, and then you know you just stumble upon like a freshly cooked you know sirloin steak or something like that, just some delicious, nourishing meal, and you're just like, oh, I want to eat that so bad, but. Saul's there like, no, you can't have it because we're religious here. You know, we're, we're trying to get right with God or whatever. I mean, that what, what a, you could see why they're distressed. And this is what hyper-religious people do. They just, you know, they bring people down, basically. It says in verse 27, But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath, wherefore he put forth the end of his rod that was raised in hand and dipped in the honeycomb and put it to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. So it's not like, it doesn't sound to me like God's honoring Saul's oath here, or Saul's decree here. Yeah. It, you know, he's not, of course, you could say Jonathan didn't hear it. But notice this, it says in verse 28, Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that, eat, uh, that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. He doesn't say God came through and supernaturally, you know, strengthened them. You know, he didn't, he didn't give them, uh, you, know, the, you know, manna from heaven. God didn't see them through. God let them be faint. Because this decree was not of God. This decree was from a hyper-religious man. And hyper-religious people, you know, they have unrealistic expecta expectations of others. They have unrealistic expectations for other people. Even if they themselves have this, this, this standard in their life. And they're welcome to have that. But we can't just go around putting that same expectation on everybody else around us. It doesn't work that way. And if we're prone to do that, to go around and say, well, you know, I meet this standard and I do this, that's fine. You know, have that unto God. But if you're going to go around and put that on other people, you know, that you might be hyper-religious a little bit. <clears throat> I mean, that's what Saul's doing here. This unrealistic expectation. Go into battle and fight a war, but don't eat anything. <laughs> go ask anybody in the army, did they feed you? Yeah, every day. I mean, they, they have entire branches of the, of, the, of the army. That's their one purpose, to bring in food, to nourish the troops, to make sure that they can, you know, stay strong and healthy to fight the battle. Not Saul, though. He's just putting this unrealistic expectation on these people. Go fight and don't eat. It's, it's not real. It's not, it's not realistic. He expects them to fight on an empty stomach when God commanded no such thing. You don't see God saying, well, I'll do something about it if you tell them to fast. He never said that. And in fact, when you look through Scripture, we're running out of time so we won't look at all these examples, but there are, there are actually examples contrary to what Saul's doing here in Scripture. I mean, you could talk about the fact that God fed you know, the Israelites with manna in the wilderness. He did a lot of other miracles leading up to that. He didn't say, you know, go through the wilderness and, and don't eat. Just, you'll be fine. You know, he took the time to feed them. And they got involved in wars. They went out and fought battles. <coughs> Excuse me. And, he, and God fed them. What about Elijah when he was running for his life from, uh, from Jezebel, right? And he, and he loathed his life. He, he went down and sat on the tree and said, you know, ask God that he might die. And God says to the angel and he feeds him twice. Let's him sleep. He feeds him, lets him sleep some more, feeds him again. And he says, Ri you know, so rise and eat for the journey is long. You know, it was 40 days he had to go on that meet. He didn't just say, well, you know what? Just start marching, buddy. Start walking. And, you know, if you're faint in the way, that's your fault. That's your problem. That's, that's Saul's mentality, this unrealistic expectation. That's not the Lord. The Lord didn't come up with this. <clears throat> See, the, hype, the expectations of hyper-religious people often cannot be met. They're not realistic. They put them on other people, but they cannot be met. They have this super high bar. It's just it's unattainable. And it, it just leaves you feeling like a loser if you're trying to live up to that. It can't be met. And what people who, you know, people who, who come into the influence of hyper-religious people, what they end up doing is they end up just giving up. They end up just saying, well, forget it then. I, I can never meet this person's high bar. I can never meet this, this unrealistic expectation that they set for me. So I quit. And that's exactly what you see in the story, right? The people fly upon 
the spoil. They, they held out for a little while. They, they came to the wood and they saw the honey. They said, well, cursed be the man. And we're faint. But it got to a point where they broke. When they finally beat some of the Philistines and they're just like, they're, I mean, they're just taking animals, you know, just killing them and just like eating them with the blood. I mean, they're eating raw meat. That they're that faint. You know, and that's the danger of being, a, of being around hyper-religious people. Maybe not to, the, I mean, I'm not saying if you, you do that, you're going <laughs> to... You're going to find yourself in the supermarket just tearing into a steak or something. But, you know, but you, you break. You give up. You throw in the towel. And you just go back and, and you go into sin. And it was sin for them to eat with the blood. <coughs> you know, you get into a church that has unrealistic expectations for people. A lot of times what people do is they just, they can't meet those expectations. They quit. And they just go, they even go back further into the world than they were when they started. You know, maybe, maybe they weren't, you know, Doing what they, you know, they weren't doing what they're supposed to, but now they're, they're so into sin, they're just eating the raw meat now. They don't care what anybody thinks. Because it's just like, well, I tried the whole religious thing. I tried the whole church thing. You know, and they just, it's so unattainable. I'm not even going to try. I quit. That happens. People get into churches like that, you know, and, and, they, and they just go right back into the world. And they go even further than they were. Okay? <clears throat> you know, and that's why, you know, here we try not to be like that and we're careful not to do it right. you know you know and some sometimes people you know they want things to be done and we say well look it's not our place it's not our position we're not going to have these unrealistic unrealistic expectations for people do we have expectations sure we have things that people you know we expect people to do to a certain degree but you know that but they're all biblical but they're all found in scripture and the instant we go beyond that and raise a bar above you know, what's here in Scripture? We've become hyper-religious, and what's going to happen to the people in the pew is they're going to just be trying to attain it, and they're not going to be able to. And then they're just going to fall out of church. And they're going to be even worse off than when they started. They're just going to go run back to the world. So, you know, we have to be real careful in churches, as in leadership, not to go beyond, you know, what God has ordained when it comes to these type of things. To, to, you know, I'm trying to think of examples. You know, what if, what if we just said, you know, yeah, ex exactly. I was just going to go there. Soul winning. Hey, you know, we're a soul winning church. And if you don't soul win, you can't come here. <laughs> no, that's not our policy. You know, or we go soul winning. And by the way, we go soul winning every day. And if you don't go soul winning every day for at least, you know, 59 minutes and 59 seconds, you're no good as a Christian. God's not pleased with you. That's just going to wear you out. Oh, I got to meet that expectation. You know, I gotta, I've got to, you know, I've got to you know, live up to that standard. You'll wear out. You'll get faint. And then you'll just completely quit and go running back to the world. <laughs> oh, someone got somebody, right? <laughs> Amber, who got kidnapped? But here's what I'm saying, guys. That hyper-religious people, they have an unrealistic expectation for others. You know, he, that's what Saul did to his people. He puts this up there for these people, and they end up just going back to, to, to you know, they even go back even worse than when they started. And I'll close with this. Hyper-religious people are often hypocrites. Hyper-religious people are often hypocrites. I mean, think about some of the most, go over to Matthew chapter 23. We'll close there. Matthew chapter 23. We're going to close in Matthew tonight, so keep something there. I'm almost done. Think about some of the most hyper-spiritual people in the Bible. Who would they be? It'd be the Pharisees, wouldn't it? I mean, I, mean, the, I mean, these guys have rules on top of rules, right? And they're like, they're washing their hands. They're making sure all the pots are clean. They tithe, you know, on the mint. They tithe, uh, tithe on the cumin and the, what was the other one? Uh, there was another. Cumin, mint, rue, right? They, they, I mean, they just, they just, they are crossing all the T's and dotting the I's when it comes to the law. I mean, they are rigid in their, you know, their legalistic thinking. The problem is their motive is all wrong. And look at verse chapter 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. What he's saying is, look, what they're telling you is right. They're sitting in Moses' seat. If they're teaching you the law, then it is right. Okay? All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Look, if they're telling you something out of the law, out of Moses, you need to do it. But do not after their works. For they say, they say, thus saith the Lord, and they show you, but they do not. They're hypocrites. That is the definition of a hypocrite. 
For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they with themselves not move them with one of their fingers. So what they are is they have this high religious expectation, right? This grievous, uh, what does he say? This grievous, this, this heavy burden that's grievous to be born. They say, well, we're going to put that on you. But then they will move them with one of their fingers. They're hypocrites. Their motives are wrong. He says in verse 5, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. So whenever they actually do do something, the only reason they do it is to be seen of men. That they, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. <coughs> Catholic church. <coughs> you know, at the Episcopalian church. <coughs> Excuse me, I had something in my throat. And, um, and they love the uppermost uh, uh, room at feasts. You know, uh, you know being, they like to be the big shot. They like to be seen. <coughs> Paul Chapel. With his buddy John MacArthur. That's another sermon. And they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and chiefs in the, and, and, and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They're hypocrites. Hyper religious people are often hypocrites. And hyper religious people, and I'll close with this, they have to be stopped by others. <laughs> it's, I mean, they're not going to stop themselves. Nobody stopped Saul. They were just like, do whatsoever, do whatever, whatsoever that seemeth good unto thee. Do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee, Saul. You know, nobody was putting an end to it. And he just kept going and going and going. And now, you know, it, it comes to a point where they have to finally say, enough's enough. We're going to put a stop to this. Other people have to stop them. They're not going to stop themselves. Because they can't see themselves for what they are often when, when you're hyper-religious. They can't see it. They're blind to the fact. That they just think... You know, that's the way it's supposed to be. Other people can see them for what they are. What they are. And that's what we saw in our story. Just keep something in Matthew there, but go over to, back to our first Samuel. It says, then, Jonathan, then said Jonathan, my father hath troubled the land. Right? When they said, hey, God, your, your dad said not to eat any of the honey. He said, oh, what a wise man my dad is. He said, he's that idiot. He's troubled the land. Right? That hyper spiritual jerk. What is he thinking? That was Jonathan's response. He could see Saul for what he is. That's why the whole the chapter starts out with, and Jonathan told not his father. Right. Didn't even bother telling his dad what he was about to go do because he knew what his dad was. He could see him for what he is. You know, hyper-religious people, they have to be stopped by others because they cannot see themselves for what they are. But the people around them, they can see it, usually. Somebody can. He said, see, I pray you how my eyes have been enlightened because I ate a little of this honey. He said, we could have such a greater victory if my dad hadn't been such an idiot. He's troubled the land. The Bible says in Galatians, if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, like Saul, I'm this great religious man. I have the priest and the ark and I've proclaimed a fast. I'm really something, but he's nothing. He's troubled the land. He deceiveth himself. The only person he's fooling is him. I mean, sure, you might snow a few other people along the way, whatever, but at the end of the day, he's deceived. He himself is deceived. He cannot see himself for what he is, the hyper-religious person. And other people, they, they have to see him for what he is, and then they have to step in before he goes too far. Before he goes too far. Because, you know, we saw there <laughs> what happened in verse 43. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what thou hast done. And he tells him how he tasted the honey, so on and so forth. And, and, the, and, and it says in verse 44, And Saul answered, God, do so more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. I mean, there's just no end in sight. Who's next? Maybe he will turn on the people after Jonathan. Maybe if his next prayer doesn't get answered, he'd be like, I bet it's because they ate the, with the, the meat with the blood. Let's just get everybody together and, 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 and slay them. <clears throat> Somebody else has to stop in. And the, it says in verse 45, And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die, who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? So that's, Saul's worst fears are coming true, right? And we'll see that with David later. You know, Saul, David has slayed his ten thousands and Saul has thousands. He's, he's getting the glory. The glory is going to whom it is, you know, deserved. Jonathan deserves that because that's true. He's the one that went out and, and, and fought this battle, stepped out in faith. And, they are, and the people are saying, hey, he's the one that's wrought this great salvation in Israel. They were just going to let Saul take him out. They said, you, you know, they didn't say, do whatsoever seems good to thee. You know, they finally said, that's enough. You got to stop, buddy. You're going too far with it. We could put up with your fake priest. We could put up with your, you know, your 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 stupid fast that nobody asked for. We could go. We'll go ahead and put ourselves out there and make us faint. But there comes a point where people just said, "Enough. You got to stop. You're not going to kill Jonathan." <clears throat> so the people rescued Jonathan 
that he died not. I mean, the hyper-religious guy, he would have killed Jonathan. He said, yep, Jonathan's got to go. Especially after they heard what the people said. <laughs> after he heard, oh, Jonathan's wrath is greater. Oh, no, he, you don't understand how bad Jonathan is. He's, he's got to go. I'm, I'm the, big, the, the, the big man on campus here. I'm the, 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 the spiritual one, not him. And the hyper-religious, we'll see, last of all, they preach for doctrines the commandments of men. Of course, we know that from Matthew chapter 15. And they preach things. Uh, let's, just, let's just read it real quick. We'll end here. Then uh, came Jesus to the scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So they're saying, look, it is a tradition. They say the law of God. They know it's the, tra the tradition of the elders, something they came up with, that they wash not their hands before they eat bread. They say, why aren't you washing your hands? You know, why aren't, where's your mask? <laughs> right? It's in my pocket. Uh, I probably, I think I already told this story. They're knocking at that lady's door. Why aren't you wearing a mask? I'm like, I'm pulling on. No, no, thanks. <laughs> you know, any reason they can find to tell you to go away. You know, why don't they wash their hands before they eat? But he answered and said, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? I love how he doesn't answer him. He just turns the table on him. Well, hey, let's take it up. Why are you transgressing God's commandments? You know, you know forget about your stupid tradition of the elders. You're transgressing God's commandment, you hypocrite. That's what he's telling them. Why do you transgress the, the commandment of God by your tradition? And he goes on and so forth, so on and so forth. And he says in verse 7, <clears throat> well, let's back it up to verse 6. And honor not thy father and his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God, the commandment of God of none effect by what? By your tradition. By your commandment. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth. Oh, they say all the right things. They sound super religious. They play the part real well, but they're, uh, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their, their motives are wrong. And in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's what the hyper-religious people do. They will preach for doctrines the commandments of men. They'll even lift up their own tradition above what the Bible actually says. You know, and I was trying to think of, of, of some... Um, some examples of this you know how about how about um you know people who who argue you know that we shouldn't have birthdays we shouldn't celebrate birthdays oh you know little johnny's gonna cut a cake and open some gifts and blow one of those little stupid things you know or whatever or smack a pinata and eat some candy get over it what's the big deal right. oh well that's you know you shouldn't do that or how about and I, that's un unbelievable. And they'll say, well, you know, the only place in Scripture that says anything about birthdays is Pharaoh and Herod, two wicked men. Therefore, we shouldn't do it. Look, that's poor reasoning. That's very poor reasoning. I've got a couple, I've got a birthday coming up for my daughter coming up here in a few days. We're, we're going to be eating cake, buddy. There's gonna be, we're lighting some candles. How about people say, you know, you shouldn't use musical instruments in the New Testament church. You shouldn't use them. You're, you know what those people are? They're hyper-religious. They're teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Does God have to reiterate everything he said in the Old Testament and the New Testament? How about that's why, he had, that's why we have the Old Testament? So we can go back and read about all the praise him on the psaltery and the harp and the cymbal and the high sounding this and blah, da, 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 and all the many, 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 many musical instruments. A whole book of praise. The one commandment that's in the Bible more than any other. Praise ye the Lord upon all these musical instruments. Then you get into the New Testament where he says, you know, uh, admonish one another, you know, in psalms and hymns. Psalms and hymns. And so we're just, supposed to, we're just supposed to, you know, sing about musical instruments but not actually play them? It's stupid. It's hyper-religious. It's hypocrisy. It's teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. <laughs> and, they'll say, and, you know, they argue things like that. I've even heard people, they argue against Thanksgiving. Now, that's where I draw a line, people. <laughs> that's where, I mean, you got, maybe you have an argument for your birthdays because of Herod and everything. They, they have a little bit of ground because musical instruments aren't specifically mentioned in the New Testament. But the Thanksgiving thing, no. And they argue, they say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about Thanksgiving. Therefore, we shouldn't do it. That's not, that is a logical fallacy. You cannot argue from silence. You can't justify your position by what the Bible doesn't say. And when you start to do that, what you're turning into is hyper-religious person who's beginning to teach for doctrines the commandments of men. And there's many other things, we, you know, other things are coming to mind, but we've got to wrap it up. What I'm getting at is this tonight, is that what we practice must be backed up by clear, by clear scripture. Anything that we practice in the church, in our personal lives, 
has to be very clear in Scripture. You have, I mean, chapter and verse for why you believe or do what you do. Or why you, 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 know, you, you practice what you practice. And not only that, but we must practice what we preach. I mean, it's, you know, it's one thing to, to say, well, the Bible does say we should do this, and you should do that. Hey, you know, this is what the Bible, come to some brother or sister in Christ and say, well, that's what the Bible says, and you need to do it. Well, are you doing it? You know, thou that you know, teachest another, teachest not thyself also? So we have to practice what we preach. We don't want to turn in these hyper-religious hypocrites. You know, by putting unrealistic expectations on people, and, you know, and, and, and expecting them to live up a standard that's unattainable. And even maybe in a standard that we ourselves are not even living up to. Let's go ahead and pray.